Hello everyone again. Uh, so from the previous keynote speaker session uh, from Kentaro, we we'll learned about the potential impact of AI on agricultural development. Um, but where are we exactly? What's the current state of digital agriculture? And let's find out. Let's find out from the next keynote from the Binstock Ag Tech team uh, for launching the state of the digital agriculture sector harnessing the potential of digital for impact across agricultural value chains in low and middle income countries report today right here right now uh, so over to you katarina thank you Jabu. welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today my name is katarina kotenko and i represent beanstalk agtech the organization that authored this report beanstalk is an agri-food innovation agency we thread a needle between ag innovation, corporate agribusinesses, governments, development organizations, as well as investors to unleash the potential of agriculture to be the leading force for good. And we're very excited to unveil the findings of the state of the digital ag sector report here today with you all. Next slide, please. This report is a global benchmark of the state of the digital ag ecosystem in low and middle income countries. The baseline for this effort came from the CTA Digitalization of African Agriculture 2019 report, and we aim to update the findings and replicate the analysis at a global scale. We have focused on four regions, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America and the Caribbean, and we did draw direct comparisons between them. Our report not only lays out tangible current overview of the state of digital ag in these four regions, but it also provides quantitative sector projections up to 2033, as well as 115 stakeholder specific recommendations to take action to reach the full sector's potential. Today we'll share just some of the insights about these numbers, but we do hope that you'll download the report and dive deeper into it. We will have a QR code for the download at the end of presentation. A couple of words about our partners before we move on. This study has been sponsored by USAID via Digital Frontiers Mechanism implemented by DAI, and it was also supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Next, please. This report has been a truly collaborative effort involving more than 200 people globally who shared their perspectives with us through interviews, workshops and surveys over the last year. Their contributions have been instrumental in shaping the insights we'll be discussing here today. And we would like to thank each and every person who have made this report possible. Next one, please. So, to assess the digital ag sector, we iterated on the existing framework that delves first into the foundational aspects of the digital agriculture ecosystems, the most prevalent use cases, their adoption, and the impact they're having. Special attention in this report has been given to gender equality and social inclusion, as well as climate smart digital ag themes which have been integrated throughout the report, but they're also discussed in detail in dedicated chapters. Next. Today, we'll highlight just a few key findings that sketch the current landscape of the digital ag sector and the further details you can find in the report itself. Um, let's move on. And before we proceed, let's just set some common ground. Digital Ag is a vast array of digitally enabled solutions aiming to foster the growth and fortify the operations of entities throughout the whole Ag value chain. Our report identified six key use cases, advisory information, market linkages and access, enterprise management and efficiency, supply chain management, financial access tools, as well as enterprise research and development. The report explores the latest trends within each use case in detail, but one notable macro level change that we wanted to highlight is the shift from solutions focusing on advisory and information to those enhancing market access. 
This is likely powered by the post-COVID-19 surge in e-commerce and digital marketplaces, as well as clear and easier monetization models for market linkage tools, as opposed to those supplying farmer advisory information. One other trend that signals sectors maturation that we witnessed is a clear tendency towards bundling, with now more than 40% of digital agritechs offering multiple use cases, rather than focusing on specific point solutions. The most commonly bundled use cases and reasons for it, as well as supporting business model, are all described in detail in the report. Next, please. In the past decade, digital ag has witnessed an explosion of innovation with close to 1,400 solutions currently active in 81 countries. Though the sector was and remains young, with almost 45 of the agritechs we identified started in just five years, the growth rate appears to be decelerating. This is likely due to market maturation, increasing consolidation, as well as unfavorable funding landscape in the past few years and the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. Interestingly, almost half of this solution come from Sub-Saharan Africa, while India and South Asia, the most popular region of low and middle income countries, is home to roughly one fifth of digital agritechs, with Latin America and the Caribbean trailing close behind. And Southeast Asia is the most nascent region in terms of number of solutions we have identified, as it's home to only about 7% of all digital agritechs in our database. And even though the innovation is slowly decelerating, uh, sorry, decentralizing, as you can see on the map, there is still very high regional concentration. Countries like Brazil, Kenya, Nigeria, India, and Indonesia, they have all emerged as regional super hubs for digital agriculture. And overall, just 10 countries are now home to two thirds of the solutions we identified. Next. As to the reach of digital ag, it continues to increase. As of 2023, we estimate that there are approximately 50 million active users of digital ag tools in low and middle income countries, which is about 10% of smallholder farming population in these regions. However, we wanted to underline that there are many definitions of usership and available data is very scarce. Our estimates, they were based on the available data points about active usership rather than merely number of registered accounts. But please do delve deeper into the report to learn more about our approach and we are open to any questions and feedback on it. More than half of this user base has come from South Asia and India in particular, with 10% of its farming population now using some form of digital agriculture tools. And in terms of relative penetration, Latin America and the Caribbean is leading the way with 17% of its population, farming population now actively using digital ag tools. However, this growth, it has been largely driven by a select group of solutions that have scaled significantly, with 27 digital agritechs now reaching over a million users, which is a very notable increase from just 11, five years ago. All of these giants are located either in South Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we have not identified a single solution that reached a million users mark, neither in Latin America nor in Southeast Asia, based on the data that was available to us. And here I'd like to pass it to Justin Ahmed, director at Beanstalk, to walk you through some of the other findings. Over to you, Justin. Thanks, Katarina. Um, Thanks, and thank you everybody for joining. My name is Justin Ahmed. I'm a Melbourne-based director at Beanstalk AgTech, and just want to echo Katarina's comments of our excitement to be um, finally sharing this report with so many of you that have contributed and lent insights to this to date. Um, I also want to echo our thanks to our sponsoring partners, USAID, um, in partnership with the Gates Foundation and um, FCDO, um, via Digital Frontiers is implemented by DAI and extend our appreciation to Dev Global and CGIAR as well for including us in this keynote session. 
Um, what I'm going to attempt to do in the next 10 minutes is walk you through, firstly, three different thematic deep dives that we delve into in the report, just the shallowest of our deep dives so that you can um, dig into the report in greater detail later. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what impact has looked like in the digital agriculture space to date. And then we're going to shift our perspective to the future and have some discussion on what is the likely or what are the avenues of potential impact that digital agriculture can have on um, economic, environmental, and social outcomes over the next 10 years. So getting right into it, um, we conduct one of the deep dives that we conducted and that you'll see in the report is around the funding and investment landscape for digital agriculture. I think there are going to be other um, your presentations over the next few days where you'll probably get deeper and richer insights with respect to the, the trends in funding and investments for digital agriculture. But we wanted to highlight a few really critical insights that we're seeing as they relate to the reach and adoption statistics that Katarina shared with you all. Uh, what is most stark is the ge geographic paradox that we see in digital agriculture, whereby you can see that um, Africa is uniquely underfunded and under leveraged. And Katarina highlighted that as much as 50% of digital agriculture solutions have historically and currently do come from Africa. And yet um, fun funding for D4Ag in Africa is less than half of what we see in India alone. Paradoxically, we actually see the opposite when we're talking about ASEAN, much larger scale of funding in ASEAN than, um, than Africa, despite, um, despite supplying only about 7% of global D4AG solutions. This really shows the shift towards um, the concentration in a few later stage, um, larger scale investments that we see in ASEAN. And it really is important to demonstrate kind of the the linkage between funding and scale, um, which, which we know is, is true. I'm For the sake of brevity, I'm not going to talk through all of the other funding challenges, but one other that really spoke out to us was about the use case concentration of private capital. We see that private investors are much more likely to invest and much more comfortable investing in more familiar business models <clears> that <throat> out of the arena like market linkages and financial access. Um, advisory platforms, farm management platforms have seen much greater challenge to, um, to attract capital. Despite that, the reality is that the vast majority of active DFRAG innovators in low and middle income countries have not raised external funds, nearly 80% of the group that we identified. And that doesn't seem to be a clear uh, linkage to profitability or scale. Another thematic that we dove deeper into was around gender and social inclusion in digital agriculture. I think what first is really important to denote is that this is a really broad um, space when we're talking about gender and social inclusion. And historically in digital agriculture, um, the evidence of impact, the volume of targeted D4 Ag solutions, and the volume of research programming has been really concentrated in a few of these sub socio demographic factors, primarily around gender. We have an increasingly strong view, still limited, but strong view of um, what are some gender specific constraints to use, access, and benefit from digital agricultural technologies. But factors such as different levels of ability, indigeneity, sexual orientation, gender expression, ethnic minorities, and others have generally gone unstudied. When just talking about gender um, equality for the moment, um, we found, first of all, that around 26% of, of is the average share of digital agriculture users for any of the solutions that we um, pulled data from um, that are female, as reported by the D4 Ag innovators themselves. It's interesting that this looks very similar to the figures that were pulled five years ago in CTA's Digitalization of African Agriculture report, though the numbers for Sub-Saharan Africa are slightly smaller. And again, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm not going to speak to all the challenges that we observed in this space, but 
one that I'd like to call out is around the lack of data, the disaggregated data that we have on use and benefit from digital agriculture solutions. While as much as 75% of the innovators that we surveyed spoke to capturing data on gendered use of their tools at level of registration, it's been largely seen as a compliance tool rather than a strategic or operational source of data. And virtually no D4AG innovators reported the use of that data um, outside of registration. So climate smart D4AG, we, we talked a lot about the intersection of climate and I'm sure climate tech and ag tech, and I'm sure you're gonna be hearing that refrain many times throughout the report. Um, obviously, as the conflation is coming between the two, we are, um, it really highlighted both the challenges and opportunities linked to decarbonization of an industry that accounts for more than 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Within each of the use cases that we've outlined, there's a unique link to mitigation and adaptation and resilience to climate change. Um, what we aimed to do in the report was outline some of the unique challenges to scale and impact based by um, climate specific digital agriculture solutions. We presented deep dives on digitally enabled climate advisory on digitally enabled micro insurance product and digital monitoring, reporting and verification tools, um, linking farmers to, um, to carbon markets and other offset marketplaces through climate smart practices. And we encourage you to dig deeply into the report to, to see some of what we, we pulled out around the varying levels of adoption, depth of evidence for impact and headwinds therein. Um, for climate advisory in particular, a, a couple of challenges or open questions uh, are principal on our mind, mainly who's actually going to pay for these solutions and who's actually implementing change. We found that farmers uh, and innovators themselves struggling uh, significantly with the agency and access to inputs that actually facilitate climate smart practices on farm. So I wanna take a couple of minutes now to talk about what does impact look like in the digital agriculture space. Um, this is something that's oft claimed and rarely measured and in large part is still more noise than signal. A lot of the, the impact that we see is more nested in marketing collateral um, than in um, academic or um, peer reviewed studies. There's been a lot of theorized impact um, from digital agriculture along economic, social, and environmental dis dimensions, but there's still relative concentration in what we're actually learning. Firstly, what's been most observed and most captured has been impact from digital agriculture on economic outcomes, so around productivity and increased incomes, and we are seeing um, a wide variance, obviously driven by context, but some um, strong signals of positive impact in those dimensions. Much less has been observed around the impact of D4AG on inclusion of women and youth, um, but have seen some pressure tested um, indications of impact related to access to knowledge, resources, finance, and especially professional qualifications for women and youth through digital agriculture. Social and inclusion and climate change adaptation and resilience to obviously um, really critical areas of opportunity where digital agriculture can play an impactful role. There's really little, um, really little observation or evidence impact to date. So we're looking forward to and advocate for more effort in that direction. It's the evidence of impact from digital agriculture is just as concentrated. Um, from a geographic lens. So only seven countries represent more than 75% of the published evidence for digital agriculture outside of India, Indonesia, and the most mature digital agriculture markets in Sub-Saharan Africa. We truly don't know much. Um, so looking forward to learning more as we capture more uh, data through the years. So now I'm going to quickly turn our attention away from what we've learned about the past and present of digital agriculture 
and turn our attention to the future. Uh, it, admittedly, uh, forecasts, quantitative forecasts make me personally very queasy. Um, but our focus has been giving an order of magnitude of what's at stake when we talk about the difference between getting the development of the digital agriculture ecosystem in low middle income countries right versus wrong over the next 10 years. And um, invite you to dig much more deeply into our report to see how we treated this methodology in a really sensitive way. So what we attempted to do was to lay out two alternative futures that essentially act as extremes or bounds um, for the future of the digital agriculture space. First, we, we outlined, I guess, our most positive scenario, what we call our thriving um, scenario, and as well as a derailing scenario where we take um, some trends that are that we expect to continue, including the development of more advanced technologies as a given. Um, but we, but consider what happens when actually the, the, the sector is not safeguarded um, or shepherded appropriately. How does that translate to quantitative impact? Well, the difference between thriving and derailing could mean as much as by 2033. Um, 400 billion, $450 billion per year in net value created lost. Um, it could be the difference between the status quo and having the gender gap in digital agriculture use by, by about 50%. Um, and it could mean the difference between um, a 9% reduction in total farm gate emissions across low and middle income countries or actually a 3% increase in total farm gate emissions. I'm gonna hand over here, before we actually talk about what are some of the recommendations that we believe can actually hedge us towards that thriving scenario, I'm gonna hand us over to a couple of other contributors to the report um, to share some perspectives on how what's at stake and how the, the development of the digital agriculture sector has looked different across the regions. So here I'll hand over to my colleague, Hamendra Mathur, who's a senior advisor at Beanstalk, venture partner at Bharat Innovation Fund, and co-founder of ThinkEgg, um, India's innovation fund. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hamendra Mathur. I work as senior advisor to Beanstalk, and I'm based in New Delhi in India. Uh, if we talk about findings from South Asia, you know, as, as we speak, there are over 304 uh, D4 AG solutions in India and the neighboring countries, uh, uh, including Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. And as you can see from the slide, uh, India is the undisputed regional leader, uh, accounting for almost 90% of these digital solution. This is largely driven by uh, uh, ag tech entrepreneurs and most of them have emerged in the last 10 to 15 years with strong hardware and software capabilities developing interesting digital solutions uh, for farmers access to markets to good quality inputs to institutional credit uh, uh, even insurance and farmer advisory uh, if we look at the adoption rate among farmers it stands at about 10 percent which means about 27 million farmers uh, in the South Asian region using digital ag uh, tech tools, which I think is a great start given the fact that uh, the ecosystem is relatively new. I think one of the primary drivers for high level of adoption is improving access to broadband, internet, and smartphone penetration. But most importantly, that majority of the farmers see value in adopting digital solution. Uh, and as we see, even among users, almost 88% of the user base is concentrated solely in India. If we look at the future projections, uh, clearly there's a huge opportunity. Uh, South Asia with India is a, is a key contributor, uh, and it may see an additional income of as much as 179 billion US dollars 
if D4AG thrives over the next decade. However, as Justin mentioned, if things don't go that way in a negative scenario, the figure could be just 10% of the overall potential. A very important point on the gender inclusion, uh, we see about 43 million women uh, farmers actively using uh, D4AG solutions, which I think is a large number. And I think it is extremely important. I must highlight that a lot of agriculture in South Asia is becoming feminine uh, with the women farmers actively engaging in sectors like animal husbandry, dairying, and horticulture. So clearly in a thriving scenario, we see the potential of gender inclusion to be extremely high with as much as about 43 million women uh, using a D4AG solution. Uh, South Asia could also lead with the highest reduction in GHG emission across LMIC amounting to almost 149 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent under a thriving scenario, mainly driven by improving regenerative forestry and soil practices. However, if the action is not taken, we are set to see an emission, uh, uh, an emission growth by 2033. Uh, so clearly, uh, uh, in summarizing South Asia, a great start, but a lot to be achieved uh, and the potential is huge. So I'll pause here and I'll hand it over uh, to my colleague, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Amandra. Uh, so my name is Jessica and I'm an agronomist and project manager with over 10 years of experience in tropical agriculture innovation. And I serve as a advisor expert here in Beanstalk and as a manager of innovation agribusiness at uh, AgriHub, uh, Innovation Hub organized by farmers in the state of Mato Grosso in Brazil. And today I want to share some insights from the visibility of the digital agriculture in Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, so let's dive uh, right into it. And first, let's talk about the numbers. In LAC, in Latin American Caribbean, we have identified a total of 240 active digital ag solutions. Uh, and over 18 of these solutions are concentrated in just three countries, Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia. And Brazil has emerged as a regional leader in DG4 Ag innovation, accounting for more than 16% of all identified solutions and half of the region's active users here in the region. Uh, within the Latin America, the current adoption rate of DG4 Ag is the highest across for the four regions of the focus of this study. So an average is it stands at 17% with almost 18 million farmers, farmers actively using digital agricultural tools in the region in 2023. Now, despite this impressive growth, uh, there are some challenges. Uh, funding in the sector is still highly concentrated in Series A investments, leaving limited opportunities for early stage startups to thrive and stimulate the, the development of new technologies for farmers. Uh, Jesse? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, to ensure the long term growth of our innovate, innovative ecosystem, we need to address the issue and create a nurturing, a nurturing uh, environment for startups. There, that's where the enablers come in. Enablers here play a vital role in connecting innovator with potential clients, investors, and companies interested in open innovation. Here in Brazil, we have some ex excellent examples of how enablers advise and connect innovators, and we aim to strengthen this role further as Acta Garage Innovation Hub, AgriHub, Pulse Innovation of uh, Raizen, another company of uh, energy, 
And now here in Brazil, particularly with AgriHub, we have two primarily uh, objectives with this study. So it's a use case for the to apply this study here in Latin America. First, we want to use these insights for this study to reclassify the use of the technologies with our uh, ecosystem. We understand that our ecosystem has maturity enough and we have startups that offer integrated solutions or address more than one problems to farmers. So it's a, a system, it's integrative, the, the use of the technology. So it's not only a FinTech technology, it's an ag FinTech because they use data for farmers and uh, offer this to create more opportunities to farmers receive uh, rural credit, for example. Uh, and in another way, another hand, it's by standardizing the segmentation of the startups. So you can be more systematic in connecting them with another ecosystems, particularly on an inter international level. What does this mean? Our startups often face difficulties when entering international marketings due to the lack of clarity regarding testing environmentals and technology classifications would use it only here in Brazil. And because of course of our kind of agriculture that is the tropical agriculture use. So you want to everyone speak the same language and simplify the process of going global, allowing us to share our best innovations with the world. So in conclusion, DG4 Ag is traveling, is thriving here in Latin America and the Caribbean, but uh, there are some challenges to address and creating more nutrition environment for startups and enhancing the role of the neighbors. We can continue, continue to drive innovation in the agriculture sector, not only in our region, but also the older low and middle income countries. So this is, thank you for the attention. Now I will hand over my colleague Claude to talk about, of, about some learnings from Sub-Saharan Africa system. Thanks, um, 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 Jessica. Hi, everybody. Um, Claude Midisha, advisor at Beanstalk, also a digital ag um, specialist. Now, uh, back to Sub-Saharan Africa, um, I would say that we really came across some interesting findings, as, as Justin noted earlier. Uh, despite being the home or birthplace of many innovations, um, Sub-Saharan Africa remains uh, low in terms of attracting funding, uh, primarily uh, benefiting from development fund coming from international organization. Um, again, as Justin did mention earlier, um, we really find out that Afri South, sub saharan Africa as, as a region accounts for almost 50% of all the digital ag solution uh, we have identified across uh, low and middle income countries. And as of last year, 2022, um, we've been able to identify 666 active uh, digital for ag solution, uh, which actually makes uh, sub saharan Africa as the highest um, in terms of region with digital ag solution across middle income, other middle income regions. Again, uh, with no surprise, we noted that Kenya and Nigeria uh, continue to lead the way uh, and both account for 45% of all digital ag innovation that we were able to find. Uh, in terms of user adoption, um, there's been growth uh, over the past five years and, and, and we've sort of ex expanded on that in the reports. I really encourage you to through it um, and in terms of estimates um, as of this year 2023 uh, we estimate that there are around 11 million active users of the digital ag tools in the region um, the active adoption rate stands at five percent so there's, there's been a lot of debate around active and non-active users again i really urge you to read through the report we've made a clear distinction between how we arrived at these numbers um, However, uh, the level of adoption varies across the region. Um, as, as you probably know, Af Af Sub-Saharan Africa has regional blocks and 
you know, the level of adoption tend to, we notice that it tends to vary across the regions, uh, depending on the maturity of the digital bag ecosystem. And there is large room for growth, you know, for instance, English speaking, can, can, English speaking regions um, tend to have more robust digital ag innovation use and uptake if compared to francophone speaking um, uh, regions. Now, in terms of the, in the future or looking ahead, um, in a thriving scenario, uh, back to the scenario I explained earlier, um, Sub-Saharan Africa is projected to generate an additional income of 111 billion USD enabled by Digital for Lag over the next decade. Um, however, if action is not taken, uh, this number can drop to less than 10% of the sector's potential. Still uh, looking ahead uh, in a thriving scenario, um, if intervention are done properly, it could lead to one in three females in agriculture using digital for, for ag tools. Uh, this would reduce the gender gap by half and bringing in an additional 10 million women into the sector. This is also critical for Africa. Um, also speaking of the current challenges around climate change, uh, there is an, there's an opportunity to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 62 megatons per annum by 2033, that's in the next 10 years. However, uh, the full potential is not realized and we are set to see an increase in emissions. So overall, um, it was quite interesting to, to note how Africa is, is a birthplace to many innovations. Um, it's a young continent, but unfortunately, um, it doesn't attract a lot of investment. It's rather donor money. Uh, but again, at the same time, should we have conducted this study 10 years ago, we would probably have interviewed or engaged um, 40, 50 years, 60 years plus individuals. So for this particular study, uh, we really, in, in a lot of actors that we spoke with are young people. And that really brings hope that you know, if young people, uh, tech savvy, well-educated, uh, enter the space um, as farmers, as investors, it will elevate Africa on the global map and actually attract uh, more funds and, and, and allow the sector to grow and have an impact on smallholder farmers and, and small-scale producers' livelihoods. Uh, thanks. And with that, I will hand over to uh, Justin uh, for the next part of the presentation. Over to you, Justin. Thanks a lot, Claude. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say a, a couple of really quick notes around Southeast Asia because I know we're drawing close on time. Just as a Australia-based and um, development and innovation practitioner who works a lot in the Southeast Asia market, I was somewhat surprised um, to see uh, the regional position in terms of both level of active adoption rate uh, which is 6%, so about on par with Sub-Saharan Africa in, in general, and the supply of D4X solutions. So as we call it out, only about 7% of the global market. And you can see from the zeros on the, on the chart to the right, that even despite Indonesia's growth and investment in the space, we, we, um, we didn't really identify any market leaders um, on, on par with maybe some of the, the investments and level of activity in digital agriculture in India and uh, Brazil and otherwise. Um, I think we only identified seven solutions that had more than 100,000 um, users. And we know that language barriers, cultural differences, and particularly geographic remoteness um, outside of key metropolitan areas of um, of, of the region really hindered the, the expansion and growth of solution, but still there's a lot at stake. Um, the, the, the difference between the thriving and derailing scenarios equaling about $80 billion of net value creation, nearly 10 million women, increments of women using digital agriculture and about 90 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And what I found really uniquely interesting and hopeful around the Southeast Asia region is the amount of effort and organization coordination that ASEAN as a regional body has really driven um, towards more inclusive and impactful use of digital agriculture. So looking forward to how those learnings can be applied in other regions. So I hope what's coming through all of your minds um, as we've been highlighting what's at stake in different regions is what does it actually take to achieve the thriving scenario that we've outlined 
there are six kind of overarching recommendations that we've called out that we think will help us bridge the gap over the next 10 years around firstly supporting the formulation and implementation of inclusive climate smart policies for digital agriculture around investing in capacity building and knowledge sharing across the D4Ag ecosystem, around sustaining, boosting, diversifying funding and investment for D4Ag, around accelerating the development and infrastructure to support D4Ag, fostering collaboration, data and resource sharing around the ecosystem and honing in on digital agriculture end user needs through focused and inclusive engagement. If I heard these at the end of the, um, at the, end of the presentation, I might be thinking that's it, that's really high level. Um, but we really encourage you to dig deeper into the report where we've outlined 115 more specific recommendations and actions that map to these six, um, where that government, donors, agribusinesses, enabling service providers, investors, innovators, and producers themselves can take, um, specific to, to them, to um, act on these recommendations and opportunities. So with that, please do screenshot this, scan the QR code, reach out to myself, Katarina, or anybody else um, who's contributed to this, this report, and really looking forward to hearing from all of you. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to hand over to Josh Woodard, um, the, the Senior Digital Advisor of the Bureau of Resilience and Food Security at USAID and a principal partners of ours on the development of this project to um, share his own reflections. Great, thanks so much, Justin. Um, and just to note, as of a few weeks ago, we are now the Bureau for Resilience, Environment and Food Security um, at USAID. We just uh, had a reorganization um, a few weeks ago. But anyway, um, so, as we've just heard from the presentation from the Beanstalk team, uh, you know, there's a potential for d for ag to unlock almost $500 billion uh, in the next 10 years, per year in the next 10 years in LMICs, um, and to cut the gender gap in half. Um, but, we, you know, we also know that reaching that thriving scenario is not a given. It's going to require each of us to do our part to realize these gains um, in line with the recommendations laid out in the report. There are also opportunities for stakeholders to collaborate to support a more inclusive and impactful digital agriculture ecosystem. So I hope that you'll read the report and use its findings to guide your actions and investments in the space uh, over the coming years. For our part, the US government's global food security strategy, uh, which was finalized last year, makes very clear that, and this is a quote, uh, digital technology must play an integral role in the U.S. government's work in food systems, rather than being treated as an add-on or an afterthought. It further emphasizes how, and again, this is a quote, um, this will require an ecosystem approach that considers the benefits, drivers, barriers, and risks of digital technology for all stakeholders in food systems, while prioritizing financial viability of digital products and services, rather than one that is predominantly, that is driven predominantly by individualized project needs without longer term planning. So I think you know, this report is going to be critical for us to realize um, those goals, you know, both as uh, from our perspective in USAID, but also I think for other practitioners um, in the space. In addition to launching the, this report today, um, I'm also really pleased um, to be launching that we'll be launching it with partners two other guidance documents at the conference to support stakeholders um, in the journey of making d for ag more inclusive. The first one, which is um, a toolkit on inclusive digital de design, is going to be launched during the first breakout session today. Um, so I think in about an hour from now, so I encourage people to join that session. Um, the second one is a guidance document um, on breaking silos in digital development, and that's going to be launched during the second to last keynote on day two of the conference, uh, which depending on your time zone might actually be on November 9th. Um, so I encourage you to attend both of those sessions um, or if the timing doesn't work uh, for you, please do watch the recordings after the fact. Um, I'm pleased now to pass the microphone to David Saunders from Ryder Bridges, um, who's going to introduce the new AgBase initiative that aims to further support development of an investment in the d for ag ecosystem. So David, over to you. Thanks, Josh, and um, thank you, Beanstalk, for a great presentation. 
and also for inviting us to also be on this panel. Um, so my name is David Saunders. I'm a director at Brighter Bridges. Um, we, Brighter Bridges is representing that small logo um, on the presentation that Justin and the team gave called AgBase. Um, Brighter is a data and, and intelligence firm focusing on unlocking investment opportunities across the global south. And over the last 18 months, we've been working with a number of funders in the climate and, and agricultural space. And one of the things that we keep picking up, um, and I think in line with this state of sector report, is the need for improving the, the relevance and quality of data and information to support investment and innovation decisions in this digital for agricultural sector. So this is really the drive behind that new initiative ag base that um, Josh was referring to. Uh, we're in the process of finalizing it. Um, it's between us, Mercy Corps Agrifin, and the Gates Foundation. Um, as I said, it's going to be called AgBase and really aim to be uh, really a, a, a leading data and intelligence platform focused on promoting impactful investment and innovation in the D4 ag sector in Africa. And it really builds on this state of sector report that Gates and USAID have been, been funding. Um, and there were a couple of things that I thought were really interesting um, in the report and in the presentation that there are specific areas that Agbase will, Ag will be, really be looking to dive deeper into. So one of the things that I think was really valuable was this Global South comparables that, that the Beanstalk team was able to do. Um, and you can see there's the most innovators in Africa, the most funding and impact in India, the most commercial viability in Latin America and the Caribbean. How do we take this like larger, um, uh, how do we take these different parts and kind of add them up in a way that actually helps investors and innovators to learn from what's working and what's not across different regions that they can apply in their own. Africa is going to be the major focus for AgBase, despite us collecting more regional information. But there's a there's a major reason for this. As as the Beanstalk team showed, it has the biggest funding gap, the least commercial investors, and currently limited reach in terms of the impact of these D for Ag solutions as well. So you know how can information and intelligence address this? How can we pull more funders and more funding into the space to deliver on on the outcomes that Josh was speaking about? They also spoke a little bit about business models that are working. Um, so what we saw is that, you know, more than 60% of innovations um, in Africa are not breaking even, um, you know, less than 40, less than 40% across all emerging markets are. And we're seeing that different types of business models are showing different types of promise and challenges, such as business to, you know, consumer facing models, B2B models, or even the bundling that Justin spoke about. You know, what is that new data and intelligence that we really need to understand, that we really need to understand what's working in, in what context and for what type of outcomes? And I think the biggest piece that, you know, really came here that, that I've taken away from this presentation is only 10% of smallholder farmers are currently being reached through these D for Ag solutions. Only 25 or a quarter of these are female smallholders. This has the potential to grow significantly, but what is the data and intelligence that can assist funders with really driving the biggest impact through their investments. And also considering the environmental and carbon ele uh, climate element, how can we promote digital solutions that contribute to other impact areas such as climate mitigation and adaptation? I think as the team was showing, ag can play a big role in reducing carbon emissions. So these are some of the areas that AgBase will really be looking to focus on. While we'll have a deep focus on driving impactful investment in Africa, particularly for D for Ag solutions that can support smallholder farmers and agribusinesses, we're gonna have a reach across the global South. We think being able to show comparables for different types of investors and innovators can really assist in delivering sustainable impact for Africa. We're also gonna be increasing the visibility of unfunded opportunities. So one of the things that the Beanstalk team highlighted is that 50% of solutions that they identified in Africa are unfunded. How can we increase the visibility of these solutions to funders and also help these innovators find potential funders themselves? We need to go a bit deeper into you know, what business models and actually what's working and what is driving sustainability. B2C models have been really struggling across all sectors, not just ag in Africa, but they can also be very impactful because they directly reach farmers. How do we understand what within these different business models is also working um, that we can promote and, and, and really look at how we can find the right type of models for the right type of impact we want to have. And then if we're going to achieve this growth in terms of the impact of digital solutions, I think by 2030, we're looking at a 5x growth. So from 50 million farmers to nearly 250 million farmers, you know, what is the role that data and intelligence can really play there? I think this state of sector report was really a milestone in capturing the reach of D4Ag solutions. 
um, and it's really going to assist sub-commercial farmers and non uh, sub-commercial investors and, and donors in particular. But what other data do we need? How do we harmonize what's already out there? How do we provide more information and data on the reach and other relevant impact metrics that can really help to drive these decisions? So, you know, those are some of the things that we'll really be looking at. This global comparability, more of the unfunded solutions in Africa, really understanding more about business models and really going deeper into the impact side of things. And what we've learned from Brighter is that while we and Mercy Corps AgriFin have technology and capability to collect and share this data intelligence, we really need to work along the, in, the ecosystem to ensure that it's relevant to your needs. So um, we're gonna have a big focus on ag base and getting out there, engaging, listening, understanding, and pulling as many of you into our work as possible. So if this initiative resonates with you, if you'd like to learn more about it or how to get involved, please reach out to us. My name is David Saunders. We're from Brighter Bridges. You can maybe find them on LinkedIn. Otherwise, I'll ask the organizers to share some, some details just now for us. So thanks everybody for uh, spending a few extra minutes with us at the end. I think we're very, very excited for what Beanstalk has already done here with this state of sector report and really, really looking um, forward to this launching of AgBase and, and working more with all of you to, to improve the quality and relevance of data in the, ecos in the ag tech ecosystem. So I think Katerina, with that, back over to you to wrap up. Thanks, David. Very excited about the new initiative. So these insights that we presented here today are just the tip of the iceberg. We do hope you will delve into the report to uncover more and you can download it on our website by scanning this QR code, or I think there is a link in the chat as well. If you have any burning questions or ideas, please do reach out to us and let's innovate for the future of Digital Act together. Thank you all who joined us here today. Thank you to all the speakers. And that is all from our end tonight. Thank you so much, um, Bean Talk. Um, thank you to everyone who has actually contributed to this report and making it happen. Uh, I am very sure that many people will benefit of this, around the world will benefit of this report. And I am super excited and I cannot wait to see what the High City for Hard community will be doing with um, this report. Uh, so we have a lot of questions from our attendees and um, I know that we, uh, you would follow up um, after the event or perhaps at the expo time, but let's uh, quickly highlight one question that is actually here. Um, it says, you presented the users as a share of small older farms. Does that mean that you wholly review um, DG for um, D4 Ag, that's Digital for uh, Agriculture Solution, um, that are targeted at small orders as the user base? Uh, I don't know if you got the question. So I repeat, said you, re you presented the users as a share of small order. Does that mean that you are all you are only uh, you only review uh, D4 AG solution that are targeted at smaller as the user base? A lot, Femi, for um, for facilitating and um, for whoever posed that question as well. Uh, it's a good question. I, I think I would separate in, in what we actually looked at in our report versus what we put into the, the quantitative model that we shared with you all when we were actually developing that quantitative model. Yes, we tried to actually model the economic, social, and environmental impact as it related to smallholder production and used small, not actually smallholder farmers, but farmers as a proxy um, for target end users in that case. Um, and Taking that example, you could probably argue that the value of what's at stake is relatively conservative in our model. Um, that being said, across our report, we focus on digital agriculture solutions that are being leveraged and um, driving impact and across the agricultural value chain. Um, in particular, I think a couple of um, use cases that we spoke to that are particularly agribusiness oriented we talked about enterprise r d tools that are powering discover digitally enabling discovery of you know new biotech uh, products 
um, or enabling um, uh, more efficient and um, higher return R&D and research practices. So we've been uncovered much many and, and have been focused on and elaborating the dynamics behind a range of enterprise facing solutions as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Thanks once again uh, to uh, Pink Talk uh, uh, team and, and the entire team. And um, as we are actually already uh, a little bit late and behind schedule, the lightning talk has already begun. So if you are actually uh, not in the lobby, please return to the lobby and uh, select the first lightning talk and you can actually join immediately uh, after you actually exit this Zoom section. Uh, find the next section and join the lightning section. So thank you so much. So see you there.